This is the Vantru Element One dash camera. And I wanted to test this out because, well, I'm always on the lookout for a mini dash camera to compete with or maybe even replace my Garmin Mini 2 here. Now, obviously the Garmin is still a lot smaller than the Vantru, but the Vantru is still a very small dash camera compared to most. And for the extra size compared to the Mini 2, you do get 2K recording, you do get a screen on the back, and you do get GPS. These are all things that you do not get with the Garmin Mini 2. I was really impressed with this camera as soon as I took it out of the box. I mean, even the packaging was really, really impressive. It was kind of like, you know, unpacking an iPhone. It was that level of quality in the packaging. But the dash camera itself is a very well-built piece of hardware. I mean, it just feels like a quality piece of equipment right here. It's got good weight to it, uh, well-machined. It's just a really good, well-built dash camera. And also, the mount was really well-designed. So. Most dash cameras, you know, you plug your power into the side of the dash camera, you put it on some kind of a mount that's either a suction cup mount or some kind of a sliding clicking mount, or in the case of my Garmin Mini, it's a ball joint thing. But the way they did it here is that the power cable actually connects to the mount itself up here. Okay, you don't have to plug it directly into your camera. And the way the mount works is you just simply slide it in, and then a magnet holds the dash camera in place. And this is great because it just makes it super, super simple. You don't have to mess with the cables. And if you ever want to remove the dash camera, it's so fast. You just do that. You just pull it right off. And don't worry, it's not going to come flying off when you're driving because the magnet actually is pretty strong. It will hold it in quite nicely. But it's just the convenience of not having to mess with the cable, not having to you know, jiggle with anything to try to get it off of there. It's just really well designed. So the Element One comes with, obviously, the dash camera. It also comes with the 12 volt cigarette plug power cable. And it also comes with this. Now this is actually a remote Bluetooth button that connects to the camera. So if you just see something and you wanna you know, make sure the camera records it or saves it to permanent storage, you can press the little button on here. It also has a microphone toggle at the top. So I don't use this, but you know, for me it's easy enough just to reach the buttons on the dash camera. But if you have this mounted far away and you just need this little remote button, it's got a sticky pad on the back, you can stick it wherever you want, and if you need to toggle the mic or you know, save a recording to permanent storage, you can always just press this little remote button. So there are a few things that it does not come with, and one of which is a memory card. You will need to supply your own micro SD card for this. Also, you will most likely want to get the hardwire install cable, right? You don't want to really have a cigarette cable thing like this hanging down like I've got here. You're going to want to have it professionally installed. People always ask me where do I get my dash cameras professionally installed. Uh, there are numerous places anywhere you go, any you know car stereo installer and things like that. Uh, but I have lately been taking my cars to Best Buy because at Best Buy they have absolutely the best price on doing uh, radar detector and dash camera installs. I think the last time I did it, it was only like $60 or something like that. So. One other thing you definitely will need, and I talk about this in all of my dash cam videos, is this. You're going to need a polarizing filter. And the reason is this. This is what footage looks like without a polarizing filter. There's just a huge amount of glare coming off of the dashboard. And in the case of this car, it makes the footage pretty much impossible to see. But if you do get the polarizing filter, this is what the footage looks like. It's a whole lot clearer. It knocks down pretty much all of that glare. There's just a little bit of dashboard glare. So definitely get a polarizing filter for this camera. All right, so I already mentioned that on the side here we have a red incident button, right? So the incident button is when you see something that happens, say there's a wreck or you know, something crazy happens on the road and you want that piece of video footage to be permanently saved to the SD card. Now the camera's constantly writing to the SD card, but it's writing on a loop. So when the SD card gets full, it just starts overwriting the oldest pieces of footage. But if you don't want that to happen for this specific piece of footage, you press the incident button and it will save it to permanent storage. Like I said, there's a little SD card slot here. Uh, you've got on the other side uh, a uh, USB-C port here. And the interesting thing about this is, like I said, you don't power it directly to the camera. You don't run power here. So why is there another USB-C port here? Because there's a USB-C port on the mount. Well, this is actually, if you don't want to bother popping the SD card out and taking it to your computer, you can take this whole 
module off, and I showed you how easy that was, and then plug the camera directly into your computer to read the video files off of it. So that's why that is there. Now, the screen on the back is not a touch screen, okay? On the bottom, there are three buttons over here, and those are used for manipulating the uh, menu system. It's also used for uh, you know, turning off the uh, microphone and other things like that, but primarily these three buttons are used for controlling the menu. All right, so let's get to some sample footage here. Now, all of the footage you're going to see here was shot with the polarizing filter on, and it's also worth noting that what you're seeing here is actually fourth generation footage, okay? The first generation footage would have been what was recorded directly to the SD card. The second generation would have been, you know, what Final Cut Pro spat out after I edited the video. Uh, then the third generation would have been the compression utility to actually compress the video down so that I could upload it to YouTube. And then the fourth generation is the compression that YouTube does, right? So it goes through four phases. And that basically means that the footage you're seeing here is not as good as the original footage off the SD card. It still looks pretty good, but I just wanted to point out that the original footage does look a bit crisper. This dash cam is a 2K dash camera. It records at 2560 by 1440 resolution. And by the way, don't try to tell me that 1080p is 2K. It's not. If you don't believe me, Google it. I get people all the time that whenever I review a 2K dash camera, they try to tell me that 1080p dash cameras are 2K also. They are not. Also, the data rate here is 16 megabits per second. And that's actually a pretty mediocre data rate for 2K. But nevertheless, the video looks really, really good, or at least the original video off the SD card looked really, really good. I could not find any significant compression artifacts in the original footage. I mean, it really, whatever codecs they are using to encode the 2K footage, they're really, really good codecs. Because normally I would expect to see a fair amount of compression artifacts at 16 megabits at this resolution. Also, this is, of all of the dash cameras I've ever tested, easily the most accurate daytime color of any of them. Most of the dash cameras I test, the colors are usually pretty out of whack. You know, a lot of them just, the colors are just wrong. Um, you know, reds will turn to oranges and greens get a weird, you know, yellowish tint or whatever. And also, dash camera manufacturers love to oversaturate footage. It just, they think it makes it look better. But while this color isn't 100% perfect, I will tell you, it is the closest to reality of any dash camera footage I have ever seen. So kudos to them for getting the color pretty darn good. Also, this camera does record audio. You can toggle the mic on and off, like I said before. And this is a sample of how the microphone sounds. This is a test of the audio system. Checking the microphone, testing one, two, three. The camera performs well at night too. Uh, here's some dusk footage. It actually looks a lot brighter in the video than it did to the naked eye, so it did do a good job of amplifying things. Uh, at dusk, the noise is pretty acceptable. And once it gets really dark, like in this footage here, you know, obviously the ISO gain noise becomes quite severe, but this is typical of any dash camera. And also keep in mind that the polarizing filter that I have on, you know, it also acts a little bit as a neutral density filter, so it does make the camera struggle a little bit more uh, at night. So you're going to get a little bit more noise in your nighttime footage with the polarizing filter on. Now the screen on the Element 1 is very, very small. And I've said this in other dash camera reviews that I've done, but I personally think that having screens on dash cameras is completely unnecessary unless you're like an Uber driver, in which case you want the people in your car to know that they're being recorded. But for the average person, the screen really doesn't serve a whole lot of purpose. And on this dash camera, it's especially not very useful. It's a very small screen, so it's very hard to see on the screen when you're trying to align the camera. It's also very difficult to use the menu system, especially when you have the dash camera mounted and it's kind of far away. Luckily, there is a Vantru app, okay? Now, here's the thing. There are multiple ways of turning on the Wi-Fi to connect your phone to the app. Okay, and it may not be immediately obvious when you buy this. Long story short, you can either go through the menu system, do all that, or if you can understand what it's saying on the screen here, uh, then there's actually a button you hold down to turn on Wi-Fi. Or the easy thing is this, turn on Wi-Fi. 
and it just magically turns the Wi-Fi on by voice commands because this dash camera does have voice commands. So that's kind of cool. All right, so once the uh, Wi-Fi is on, you just go to your phone, you find the Vantru Wi-Fi network, you connect to it, and then here we go, connect device, okay. And then in a second, we will be connected to the dash cam. Now, granted, this does take a long time to do, so you know there are cases where you might just want to use the menu system on the camera if it's something really quick and you've got really good eyesight and you can see that tiny, tiny, tiny screen from you know two feet away. Anyway, we're in the app now. Okay, so now we can see our live view here. Okay, here's what it looks like full screen. And this is great because this is a whole lot easier you know, to align the camera, get it positioned the way you want it, uh, rather than looking on the itty bitty tiny screen over there. And of course, we can review our footage down here. Press the button at the bottom. And now here's a list of all of the footage that we've got on this thing. And you'll notice at the top, there are basically three categories. There's normal event and photo. Normal is just the looping recordings. These are the recordings that it just will continuously do and then overwrite once the uh, memory card is full. Event recordings, these are recordings that are uh, saved permanently, uh, either when you press the orange uh, event button on the dash camera or whether you use the little Bluetooth remote thing or if it detects an impact, right? So these are all pothole detection impacts on, on my uh, phone here. Um, this camera or this car has got a particularly stiff suspension, so every time I hit any kind of a bumper, it's got a big V12 in this car too, so every time I punch the gas, it, it thinks that maybe I was hit or something. So it tends to trigger quite a bit. Now you can change the sensitivity, uh, but still uh, expect to get a lot of uh, pothole recordings in there. Uh, so we can go in here, and it's not the fastest thing. All dash cameras kind of suffer from this, where uh, the Bluetooth connection is not particularly fast on these. So sometimes it just takes a while to, whoops, to get to where you want to be. Uh, these are all, let me find some good footage to look at here. Okay, here's one. Let's just play this back. So you notice a little delay. It's got the spinning icon. It's queuing it up or something. Um, we can hit play. And hopefully it'll just keep going. Sometimes what it'll do is it'll play a little bit and pause while it re-queues up. But it's doing pretty good today. I think I let it go long enough uh, that it's playing back just fine. And, you know, so this will allow you to do, to do this. You can also hit the bottom right button here. Do you want to download this file? This will download it off of the SD card. Once again, like with pretty much every dash camera out there, this takes quite a while to do. So this is just a one minute clip. Now you can set how long you want these clips to be, but most dash cameras default to one minute and that's really the best thing to have it set to. So uh, I've got a one minute clip going here and it may take over a minute to download the one minute clip. Typical of every dash camera and I'm not going to sit around and wait for it, but that's basically how it works. Okay, let's go and back out here to the settings. Okay, we're into settings. The great thing here is there are a lot of settings, okay? I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but let's uh, talk about a few that we do have. Uh, first of all, resolution. Now, I normally wouldn't talk about this. I would normally just say leave it at the maximum resolution. Why would you want to you know, record 720p on your dash camera, right? Except for one thing. This does allow you to record 60 frames per second at 1080p. Now, in reality, that's probably more important than having 2K recording. Okay, the, the footage won't look as good. It's 1080p HD recording, but 60 frames per second for legal purposes, you know, if something does happen, having a higher frame rate is probably more important than having a higher resolution. Now, people always are telling me, oh, you know, can this dash camera read license plates? And I'm always like, really, seriously? Why is license plate reading such a big thing? Go on to YouTube, watch all those dash camera footage channels and ask yourself, how many times did reading a license plate matter in this case? And the answer is almost never, okay? Pretty much what you're recording are people, you know, crossing into your lane, running red lights, things like that. You don't care about that, uh, the, uh, the license plates most of the time. So to shorten my little rant here, you actually might want to use the 60 frames per second mode. Okay, the G sensor, like I said, uh, this car, it tends to trigger quite a bit. Um, luckily, and this is kind of unusual, I've never seen a dash camera that let you set the G sensor on the different axes. Most of them just have like one setting, like what, you know, 
one to 10 or one to five or whatever, how sensitive do you want the impact detection to be? This one lets you do you know, front to rear, so that'll detect like you know, a frontal or a rear impact, left, right, or up and down. Up and down is most likely gonna be the potholes. Uh, now it defaults to three, but I have mine set to two because like I said, this car, it sets it off a lot. I probably should set it a little bit lower, especially for up and down. Uh, but you can set it and that's great. Uh, you can also set, uh, okay, one other thing worth noting, the video indicator here. You don't have to have the screen on all the time when you're driving, okay? You don't even have to have the green recording light on all the time. You can turn the screen off and you can turn that recording light off so that this dash camera essentially goes into full stealth mode, okay? You won't really notice it. It's just going to be a box sitting there with no lights. So it's great that they allow you to do that. Um, also, stamp. So on all the footage, you saw a lot of data, right? Okay, there was a time stamp, a GPS stamp, and a speed uh, stamp. You can set that up. So if you don't want it to record your speed on your footage, you can turn that off. Um, luckily, you can also turn the brand model stamp. That's where it would have shown, you know, Vantru up there. There's no point in having all of your dash cam footage advertise what brand camera you're using. So I always turn that off. And then it has number stamp. And that, for some reason, is if you want to enter your license plate number, uh, it will show that on there as well. So you can totally configure that. Uh, it does have a time lapse mode, but you know, who uses that? Okay, parking mode. I'm going to talk more in depth about this later, but parking mode basically has uh, four sub modes when you turn parking mode on. Uh, collision detection, which means when your car is parked, uh, you turn that on, and if somebody bumps your car, it will you know, record that little incident. Uh, you can also set the collision detection sensitivity for parking. So generally, you want collision sensitivity fairly low when you're driving, right? You don't want it constantly going off when you hit every speed bump or pothole. But when you're parked, you want the collision detection to be pretty high, right? So you might want to set it to five. Now, it's set to three here because I did a firmware update recently, which erased all my settings. But you would probably want this set to five, maximum sensitivity. So if anybody so much as touches your car, it will uh, record that. It has motion detection, oh, which only allows you to do it in certain modes, but here we go. Uh, you can do motion detection, which basically means the camera is always on and it's just looking for some motion. And if it sees somebody walk in front of your car or another car drive by, it'll record that as well. Generally, you don't want that turned on, especially if you're going to be parked somewhere with a lot of traffic, you know, like your grocery store parking lot. It's just going to be constantly on and constantly thinking that those are some sort of incident. Uh, so that's the kind of mode you only want to use if you say you're in a parking garage and there shouldn't be anything in front of you happening. Okay. But like I say, you can do this all from the camera itself in the menu system, but I do find using the app a whole lot simpler to do. Now I mentioned parking mode when we were talking about the settings. Unfortunately, the parking mode is the Achilles heel of this dash camera. Aside from parking mode, this is a fantastic dash camera. This is my favorite single channel dash camera that I've ever tested. I love it. I mean, it's basically perfect. I'd give it a nine out of 10 if it wasn't for parking mode. You know, the form factor is great. Uh, the recording quality is great. I just love everything about it. It's a really, really good dash camera. But there's a problem with parking mode. And the problem is basically it just doesn't work. Okay, it's a multifaceted problem here. The first problem is that unlike most other dash cameras, uh, well, let me explain how other dash cameras work. So most dash cameras have a special parking mode cable. Okay, it's a hardwire cable with three wires. It has your regular 12 volt, your ground, and then it has a special third wire, which is just a sensor wire. That sensor wire is, usually goes to your fuse box and it's connected to a fuse that controls anything that turns off when the car turns off. So the radio, the air conditioning, whatever. And that way, as soon as you turn off your car, that fuse turns off, the sensor wire sees it, it tells the camera, hey, the car turned off, go into parking mode. Uh, as soon as power is restored to that fuse, camera comes out of parking mode. So it's instant and it works every time. This camera doesn't work like that at all. There is no special parking cable for the Vantru Element 1. It just uses a standard you know, uh, power and ground two-wire hardwire cable. The way it knows, or the way it's supposed to know that you're parked is it just goes into parking mode automatically after five minutes of it determining that you are not moving. 
You might ask, well, how does it know that you're not moving? Does it use the GPS? Does it use the accelerometers? Does it, you know, visually look if there's any motion? Well, the answer is it visually looks for any motion. Now, obviously this has problems because if you are parked pretty much anywhere, that's not going to work. You're parked at the grocery store. There's always going to be cars going by. There's always going to be people walking by. It's unlikely you're going to get a five minute period where nothing happens. So the dash camera will never go into parking mode. Matter of fact, the entire time I've been testing this thing for the last, I don't know, two weeks now, the only time I have ever gotten it to go into parking mode is here in my garage. If I leave my garage for five minutes and nobody enters it, it'll go into parking mode. But anytime I have been parked anywhere, whether it's grocery shopping, going out for lunch, doesn't matter. This thing has never, not once, gone into parking mode because it is visually checking. Now, a lot of people on some of the dash camera forums have been complaining about this. They can't figure this out either. Uh, people have tried contacting uh, Vantru. I've tried contacting them twice, uh, two different people. Um, and I was unable to get a clear answer on this. Uh, they claim that it's not using visual. At least that's what they told one guy, that it's not using, using the visual to do this. But all of our tests, my tests, seem to indicate that that is not true. That uh, if anything moves, the camera never goes into parking mode. So that's problem number one. It just doesn't work. Problem number two is that, well, there's no setting for telling it how long you want to remain in parking mode. Now the reason that you might want this setting is that you don't want your dash camera to drain your car battery and kill the car battery, okay? The uh, hardwire cable does have circuitry, same with pretty much every hardwire cable for every dash camera. It has circuitry that will cut power to the dash camera should your car battery's voltage drop below a certain level. The problem is that the Vantru hardwire cable has a very low voltage setting. Okay, you can either set it to 12 volts or 11.6 volts. That's when it will cut power to the dash camera. It says, okay, your car battery is drained too low. Let's kill power to this thing. The problem is 11 and 12 or 11.6 and 12 volts, that is way too low. You do not want your car battery dropping that low. Pretty much every other dash camera I've tested lets you set that cutoff voltage way higher. Uh, matter of fact, on my... Uh, Garmin Mini, I have the cutoff voltage set to 12.4 volts. I also set parking mode to only be on for two hours because I don't really even want it to get to the 12.4, right? I, I really don't want to be constantly cycling the battery in any of my cars, especially this one. So this dash camera will not do that, okay? There's no way to say two hours. It's just gonna run this thing in parking mode until your battery voltage drops to 12 volts or 11.6 volts, whatever you set it to. And at that point, that is way too low. So anyway, it's got a multifaceted flaw here with parking mode. It doesn't work. It has too much of a drain on the battery with no way to fix it. Um, however, I think that a firmware update would take care of a lot of this. And, and maybe that by now, by the time you're watching this video, it may be that Vantru has issued a firmware update. So what are my final thoughts about the Vantru Element One dash camera? Well, it's essentially a near perfect single channel dash camera that has been crippled by a non-functioning parking mode. And so that leaves it in a very unusual place. You know, if you don't need parking mode or don't want parking mode, then this thing is great. I definitely would highly recommend it. But if you're like me and you do need parking mode, then this just isn't gonna work out. You know, and unfortunately I'm going to have to keep using my old Garmin Mini 2 because it just works even though it doesn't have GPS and it is only 1080p, you know, and so on and so on. This is a more feature filled dash camera. It is a fantastically designed and built dash camera, but parking mode doesn't work. So anyway, let me know what you think. I'm curious to hear your opinions on this. And as always, thank you for watching.